A large part of the work I do in scraping is e-commerce data, competitor analysis, product analysis, and all that. And I want to show you in this video how I go about scraping almost every single site that I come up against, especially ones like this. So I've covered this before, but what you want to do is you absolutely don't want to be trying to pull out links and trying to um, you know, scrape the HTML, that's just not going to work. I know if you look over my head here, I'll make it a bit bigger. I mean, this is just, it's passing HTML for this is just not going to work. What we want to do is we want to find the backend API that this site uses to hydrate the front end, to basically populate this data. To find that, we want to open up our inspect tool, our dev tools here in Chrome, go to network. I'll try and make this a little bit bigger. And then we need to start interrogating the site. Now, the first thing I always do pretty much is just sort of scroll around and see what pops up. I'm going to click on fetch slash XHR and it's responses that are JSON that we are going to be interested in. Uh, you can either move around, go to different categories or click on a product will do just fine. When you start to scale up projects like this one, you'll find that your requests start to get blocked. Then that's where you need to start using high quality proxies. And I want to share with you the proxy provider that I use and the sponsor of this video, Proxy Scrape. Proxy Scrape gives us access to high quality, secure, fast, and ethically sourced proxies that cover residential, data center, and mobile with rotating and sticky session options. There's 10 million plus proxies in the pool to use, all with unlimited concurrent sessions from countries all over the globe, enabling us to scrape quickly and efficiently. My go-to is either geo-targeted residential proxies based on the location of the website or the mobile proxies, as these are the best options for passing anti-bot protection on sites. And with auto rotation or sticky sessions, it's a good first step to avoid being blocked. For the project we're working on today, I'm going to use these sticky sessions with residential proxies holding onto a single IP for about three minutes. It's still only one line of code to add to your project, and then we can let Proxy Scrape handle the rest from there. And also, any traffic you purchase is yours to use whenever you need, as it doesn't ever expire. So if this all sounds good to you, go ahead and check out Proxy Scrape at the link in the description below. Let's get on with the video. So let's go ahead and look at what we've got here. Um, so here right away, I can see a load of images and a load of JSON data here. The one that I'm interested in straight away says availability, and this has all the product availability, the like, you know, the, basically the stock numbers and the SKUs, et cetera, for this item. That's pretty handy, that's very relevant. And the other one is right here, which is sort of the whole product data, everything that uh, comes with it. So we can see we've got all the images and stuff like that. And there's, there's pricing information in here, metadata, if I collapse these, uh, we can see everything coming up, pricing information. So this is essentially the data that I want. Now I've shown you all this before in other videos, and if this is new to you, then I'll cover everything you need to do to get started with this. But what I haven't done before is I haven't showed you more of a full project, which is what I'm gonna go through, through in a minute. Um, the first thing that I want to do though is we need to understand the API and the endpoints and what's happening. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to copy the request URL for this one, which is the product. Now we can see that this is basically essentially just their API. And by hitting it like this, we do indeed get the JSON response for this data. Now what that means is we could effectively take a different um, product, for example. Uh, let's see if I can grab the data for this one, the code for this one, and just put it on the end here, and we're gonna get that information. But how do we go about getting these product codes? Well, there's another way that we can do this, and uh, I'm gonna keep this one open, so now I've got the sort of the product link here. Oh, I'm gonna open the um, the availability one as well, so we can have all three and have a look. Where is the availability? Here, so again, here the availability. It's basically very straightforward, so I'm just gonna paste this in here. And we get the availability, again, if I change the product code it's gonna give us the availability for that product. Now, to actually find the product IDs, well, how would you find them on the website? Well, you could either go to a category or you might wanna search, and this is kind of where I tend to go for, for, uh, go for to start with. So I might type something like boots into the search, again, with this open on this side. You know, here we go, 431 results. This is how I would typically sort of look to get this information. So if I come over back to the, um, the, the data here that I had, I need to scroll to the bottom. Somewhere around here, we're going to find a um, a request. I wish it wouldn't show me all of these. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete all this. I had all the other ones. I'm going to search again, just so it comes up at the top. 
Okay, so this is it loading up. You can see it's loading up all these products, and this is because these are the, the products that have come from the search. So this endpoint is actually slightly different. It's going to give you different bits of information. We'll, we will cover that. The one I'm looking for is the actual um, search one here, search query. There we go, I found it. So what this is, is this is like basically hitting the, M the API endpoint with the search query that we gave it. And again, you know, I can put this in here. Put this in. I wish this would go away. I don't know what this is for. I wish, and I can put this in here, and here is the response. Now I'm going to just collapse a lot of this information, uh, get rid of all of this, because we're not that interested in this information. But what we are interested in, if I make this full screen and we have a good look, is we have a view size, a view set size. We have the count, which is 431, which was the whole of the search. Uh, we have the search term. And then we have the items at 48 per page, which was the view size. We also have the current set, which I believe, uh, no, there should be another one, start index. Here we go. So what we can actually do is we can start to see, are any of these parameters available for us to manipulate? So if I change the start index to 10, what happens? Okay, that wasn't the right one. Um, I think it's actually, so start index didn't work. So I'm going to change it. And quite often it's just start maybe. Okay, start is start index. Okay, that's fine. To find that out, if you were, I mean, you, you could try and guess it like that, but what you could do is you can, uh, if we just come back here and we manually go to the next page with the uh, developer tools open, you would see that and it would, it would be there. So if we scroll down somewhere along here, start is 48, we can see that there. So you can start to do everything that you would do on the page um, and just, keep an eye on the uh, the actual network tab and you'll see everything come through so now that i know that the uh, the start index works ooh, way too big we can start to put together something that's going to give us we can use to search we can have like the that we can start we want to start on zero index i guess yeah and then we can go through the items so what we have in the actual items response is somewhere down here we have a lot of good information actually and in some cases this is enough but a lot of cases you do want to go actually deep into the product itself we have the product id so this product is some kind of kids superstar boots right so now we come back to our products part endpoint and we hit this in here here's the product straight away it's come back and it's given us all this information and the one that i want to look at the most is the pricing information it's got a discount all this cool stuff right here and then we can of course go to the availability one put the product code in and here's the available availability, and this one has some availability. So you can see that we're starting to work out how their API works. Now this is not that difficult, especially if you've either worked with REST APIs before or built a REST APIs before. But my best advice, as I said, is just to look through the website. So what I wanna do now is I wanna take this and I want to turn it into something we can repeat within our code. Uh, so I'm going to get rid of this at the moment. I don't think I'm going to need this. Uh, we can always actually we can always come back to it. And I've got my um, terminal open here in a new folder. Let's make this a bit bigger. And I'm going to create a virtual environment like so. I'm going to activate it. What I want to show you now is a couple of interesting things. So I'm going to go and I'm going to use curl. I'm going to take this endpoint that we know that works in our browser. We can see it works there. I'm going to paste it here and we get denied. So this is a curl error and this is basically, you know, the akin to, you know, we can't get this data like this. Well, let's try it with requests. So let's import in requests and we'll do our response is equal to requests.get. Let's put the URL in there. We're getting, you can see that we're, we're having issues here. We're not able to stream the data for whatever reason. So I'm going to change the headers. I can't clear this up. Can I clear this up? We'll do it this way. We're going to change the headers. So we'll I'll say our headers are equal to, because you know, you always want to do a good user agent, right? User agent. And let me just grab one. My user agent. This one will be fine. Put that in here. Oh, uh, I need to sanitize and paste, please. There we go. Cool. So now we'll import requests again. And we'll do our response is equal to requests dot get and we'll grab our URL again uh, this one will be fine put you in there we'll say our headers is equal to the headers that we just created which is the user agent and response dot status code 403 
Now this is because of TLS fingerprinting. I'm gonna cover this much more in a video, much more in depth coming up. So if you're interested in finding out really why this is happening and what you can do to avoid it and how you know everything works underneath the hood, you wanna subscribe for that video. But essentially what we wanna do is we're gonna, um, I'm gonna come out of this just on any namespace issues. Actually, I don't need to. We'll do um, import, we'll do uh, from curl CFFI. We're gonna import in requests as uh, CU rec. Curl CFFI is going to give us a more consistent fingerprint that looks like a real browser. So what I can do now is I can go up to here. We don't need this one. We just want this. And instead of using actual requests, I'm going to use curl requests, uh, CFI requests, and I'll do request.status code. And I got 403 because I forgot to do this. Impersonate is equal to, and we can just put Chrome in here. You don't have to put the version. And now if I do response dot status code, we get our 200 and response dot JSON is all the data. So we basically needed to uh, get our fingerprint sorted for the, um, to make the request. You notice I didn't need any cookies. I didn't need any headers. I didn't need anything other than what curl CFFI or other you know, TLS fingerprint um, sort of spoofers do. There's a few out there and I will, as I said, I'll cover that in a following video. So now that I know that this is gonna work, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go into my, uh, we need to activate this one here. And I'm gonna do pip3 and we're gonna use that curl CFFI library, pip3 install curl CFFI. And I'm gonna use uh, rich, I always use rich for printing. We're also going to use Pydantic because I want to get it to a point where we have modeled the data a bit better. Uh, so I will install these. I think that should probably be enough for us in this instance. And I'm going to touch main.py and we'll make this open here. Now I've imported everything that we're going to need. I'm going to look at modeling my data a little bit closer. Now I've done this already, but essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, so from this, the products one and the search one, so we can get that information. I haven't done the availability one, but you can add that one on nice and easy now that you know the, the endpoint here. So we're going to model this information. I'm basically just going to take what I want from here and create a pydantic model with it. So the first one is the search item, which I'm going to have the product ID, the model ID, price, sale price, and the display name and the rating. So that's all comes from that search endpoint. And then the same thing I'm going to have with the search response, which means I can easily find out and manipulate what page and count, etc., like this. So we can see the search term, the count uh, of total items for that search, and the start index, which I talked about earlier. And then the items is the list of search items. Then I've modeled the item detail, um, which is the the information that I was after before. So I've just basically put the product description and the pricing information in as dictionaries rather than modeling them because this is quite dynamic, this data. I found some products, they don't have all of this information. So it was easier just to do it like this. Again, with the product description. So it's up to you, but basically what I'm saying is model your data. From here, I'm creating a new session. Now I gave, I created a function for this because initially I thought maybe I would want to expand on this project and then be able to import this new session function from into a different uh, you know different file or different part of the project so all i'm saying is i'm creating a session i'm using request.session and again this is curl cffi so we have this impersonate here and i also am importing my proxy now i talked about sticky proxies earlier and that's what i'm going to be using here it's not actually essential to do so with this specific site but there are sites that will be um, that will sort of match your fingerprint or your request with the IP address. And if it starts to differ, it starts to get flagged. That's a lot less common though, so this should be fine. And now I'm going to model a function that's going to go ahead and query the search API. We need our session, which we're gonna create, our query string and our start number. Uh, and I've just put in the NF string into the URL here uh, to do that. And then I'm gonna basically just get the data. From here, we want to put in something to handle if we get a bad response. So basically I've put request uh, raise for status, which is going to throw me an exception if we get anything that isn't a 200 response, basically going to let me know if we're starting to get blocked. Um, I'm not too fond of this. I think there's probably a more elegant way of handling it, but this will work just fine for now. Then we are basically taking 
the response data and uh, sort of pushing it into our model, our search response model. We're unpacking it, and I'm unpacking from the raw and item list, which is essentially this piece of information here. So raw, I'm going to go to this one, and then this one here, and then I'm going to unpack everything that fits into my models like so. Uh, again, it's up to you how you model your data. Uh, and then I'm going to return the search, which is a type of the search response model. I'm going to do exactly the same now for the detail API. Very, very similar. We're going to put the item.product ID. And this is why I like to use models with my data, because now, look, I can clearly see in this function that this takes in the search item. And then we use the item.product ID as to, to put into our URL, rather than just having, you know, the whatever piece of data from a dictionary. I find this much, much easier to see. Request race for, state, uh, race for status again. And the same thing, we're going to push our response JSON into our item detail model. I'm going to return that out. And here's our main function. We're going to create a new session. We're going to go and put a search term in here. So again, this is our session that we're giving it. The search query parameter, which I define in the other function, is hoodie. The start index I put as one. That should probably be zero, but you get the idea. And I'm just going to loop through all of these, and we're going to print out the name of the product as we go through. So I've got it to this point here. I wanted to show you up to here because this is kind of like the main part of getting the data, which is absolutely the hardest part of web scraping, and then sort of understanding how you can go through and figure out how the site's backend APIs work, and then manipulate them slightly to get the information that you're after. Once you've got that data, it's entirely up to you what you're going to do with it. I mean, you could collect more here. You probably want to do the availability, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to save this, and I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to run pi main. And we should hopefully start to see some of the product names coming through. So I've searched for hoodie, and we're now this is the information that's coming back. So I'm just looping through the um, products that were on that first search page. I think it was 48. And I'm querying their API as if I was a browser, like I showed you on this page here and just pulling the data out. So this is the absolute best and easiest way to get data from websites like this. Website owners and site designers will find it very, very difficult to protect their backend API in such a way that their front end can still access it. Just by the nature of it, it happens a lot. Now, it's not always going to be as easy as this, but you will be surprised how often it is. The only thing I will say is that if you're going to do this, you're going to be able to pull a lot of data quite quickly. So I would always say, you know, be 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 considerate and don't hammer it. If you hammer it, you're probably going to get blocked. They'll find out anyway. But pull the data that you need. It's all publicly available data. I'm not doing anything there. I'm not using any API keys here. I'm not using anything that I shouldn't do. This is all publicly available data. I'm just pulling it in the most convenient and easy way to easy easy fashion as possible. So hopefully you got the idea and you can mimic this now with your own uh, projects, etc. If you've enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate like, comment, subscribe. It makes a whole load of difference to me. Uh, it really does. Check out the Patreon. I always post stuff early on there. Or consider uh, joining uh, the, YouTube, uh, the YouTube channel down below as well. Um, there's another video right here, which if you watch this one now, you'll continue my watch time across YouTube and they will promote my channel more. Thanks. Bye.